today's reading is taken from three different uh, chapters. So the first one is chapter 1, verses... Uh, oh, where was I up to? Sorry. Um, Verses one, verses uh, twenty six and twenty seven of Genesis. Uh, then God said, "Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground." So God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, he created them. Then we go to Genesis 2, verses... <coughs> sorry. Uh, what's it going to be? 28. Genesis. The Lord God said, I am not good for the man to be alone. I will make helper and suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is my bone of my bones, and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. That is why the man leaves his father and mother, and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Then we go over to Matthew, and it's Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and he said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Today we continue with our series on marriage and relationships. Um, here I want to thank Peter for the messages over the last two weeks. I wasn't here in person, but I listened to Peter online. And what stood out to me uh, was his pastoral heart and his wealth of experience in marriage. Was it 47 years or 48 years of marriage? So we were blessed to have Peter. The topic given to me today was five signs of dating the wrong person. <laughs> I thought um, it might be better to change the title to the marks of a Jesus-centered relationship, which is more positive and relevant to not only those who are dating, but those who are not. I want to say at the outset that relationships are complex. We all have different personalities, socioeconomic backgrounds, and family upbringings. And our relationships are affected by those factors. There's no guarantee that there is smooth sailing in a relationship. Indeed, it's not always a happy ending. Some relationships are fantastic and a clear sign of God's blessing. But some relationships are painful and we wonder where God is when that happens. What I'm offering today are not magic formulas, not one-size-fits-all formulas, but suggestions of how we can follow Jesus in all our relationships. Catherine and I got married in Asia almost 35 years ago. 
at first, we didn't uh, live in our own house because we were going to migrate to Australia very soon. So we spent months living in two places, my parents' place and Catherine's parents' place. My dad was um, always kind and very nice to Catherine. But one day when Catherine was at our place, dad yelled at mum and scolded mum harshly. Catherine was taken by surprise and was very troubled by the experience. Indeed, shouting and yelling was a common occurrence in our household and it was traumatic for Catherine. You see, marrying me meant that Catherine became part of an extended family with all its values and social convention. Ours was a working class family, but Catherine's family was relatively well-to-do, although not wealthy by Australian standard at that time. My father could get angry with us very easily, but Catherine's parents were calm. My family's, my family's way of conflict resolution was simply too much for Catherine. It has taken me a long time to realize how our different family backgrounds have an impact on our relationship, even though we don't live with our parents anymore. We have different worldviews and different ways of doing things. In addition, we have different personality types. I rely on my intuition a lot, but Catherine tends to focus on the facts and what actually happens. After 35 years, we are still learning to understand each other. So how do two people relate to each other when they come from two different worlds? Let's first turn to the scriptures. It is important to start from the beginning of the Bible, Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 says that it is not good for the man, Adam, to be alone. He needs a woman to be his helper. Now, I can say from first-hand experience that I need help. I need my wife. Um, but let's remember that in the first creation story in Genesis 1, God said that what he had created was good. And indeed, he said that seven times. But in Genesis 2, verse 18, the Lord said that it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. We need to know that the word helper here doesn't mean that the woman is inferior. Both male and female are made in God's image. In fact, the word helper is often used in the Old Testament to refer to God, God himself being the helper, that he helps his people in times of need, that God is the one who rescues and delivers his people. A good example is Psalm 121, a familiar passage, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The word help here is the same Hebrew word we found in Genesis 2. Another example is Psalm 70, verse 5. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O oh God. You are my help and my deliverer. So the word help or helper in Genesis chapter 2 refers to an assistant that Adam genuinely needed. That he is alone, he really needed a helper and someone, someone who has the ability to help him. A few verses later, the Bible makes it clear that the marriage relationship between a man and a woman is very important, more important than their own parents. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one flesh. Now, it doesn't mean that we stop honoring our parents after getting married, but that the marriage relationship is unique special and more important. By the way, becoming one flesh is not simply a reference to the physical union of a married couple. It is a holistic 
an intimate relationship where the couple shares mutual love and mutual trust as well as mutual emotional support. This is why the Song of Songs in the Old Testament celebrates the emotional bond and the physical attraction between two lovers. You see, the marriage relationship is a beautiful, beautiful gift from God, one that should be celebrated and treasured and protected. We also need to bear in mind the fact that Genesis 1 and 2 are creation stories that tell us God's purpose for the world. Human beings are made in God's image to fulfill God's purpose for his creation and to glorify God in all that they do. Importantly, to fulfill God's purpose, the man and the woman are to act together as partners and support each other in their life together. The man is not to do it alone. The woman is not to do it alone. They are to serve God together. This brings us to Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus says that at the beginning, the creator made male and female. That's Genesis chapter 1. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That's Genesis 2. So they are no longer two, but one flesh, Jesus says. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Here the context is Jesus' teaching on divorce, and Jesus reminds us of what Genesis says regarding the union between the two lovers. And of course, the overarching theme of the Gospels is the kingdom of God, and we are called to seek first God's kingdom. As Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to us as well. So that's our purpose. Seek first God's kingdom, and everything else will be added to us. So here is the foundation for a marriage relationship. Seek first God's kingdom as mutual partners. Let Jesus be at the center of the relationship. Of course, each of us is made in God's image in a unique way. The husband and the wife have different gifts, and God's purpose for them is different as individuals. But they are nonetheless partners in their life together. When I was a young Christian, God graciously allowed me to experience his love and his presence. And I knew that I was to love him with all my heart, all my life. I wanted to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. What I didn't know was that this would set the foundation for my relationship with my future wife. I was baptized in 1985, and guess what? The only other person baptized on that day was a lovely woman called Catherine. I didn't really know her back then, and I had no desire to date her. My prayer at the time was simply that I might follow Jesus wholeheartedly, and all the other relationships are secondary. I wanted to seek first God's kingdom, believing that everything else would fall into place. Indeed, that's what happened. In the following months, I found myself doing things together with Catherine. I realized that she was becoming a very special person in my life. And suddenly, I realized how blessed I was. But my prayer continued to be that I would love God first and seek his kingdom. And in a sense, this continues to be my prayer and Catherine's prayer. Our whole marriage builds on that, that we love God and that Jesus is always at the center of our life. It is with this foundation that we learn to love one another and support one another and care for one another. Now, let me share with you uh, my thoughts on the marks of a Jesus-centered relationship. In In fact, I will simply ask a few questions that you may want to ask if you are dating someone. 
I think these questions are important, and some of them uh, may be relevant to a married couple, as well as those who find themselves in a position to support others in their relationships. So, here we go. Question one, is this person a Jesus follower? Is this person a Christian? Now, I have to say that I know some married couples who started off with both the husband without both the husband and the wife being Christian. And God is able to redeem that relationship and, um, yeah, God protects that relationship. But I'm sure that you can see how helpful it is that both partners have the same life orientation, have the same desire to follow Jesus and share the same communal life in a local church. So indeed, it is vital to date a Christian. Question two, is this person totally committed to you? Does this person put you first apart from God himself? To this person, are you more important than everything else, including the church, his or her family, parents, and career? Remember what Genesis says, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Yes. We need to continue to honor our parents. Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 6, and the career helps to pay bills, but the relationship with a good foundation includes commitment to one another. Now, of course, you can't expect a couple to be committed to one another right at the start of their relationship. It takes time to develop a relationship. But I think you know that at some stage in your relationship, mutual commitment becomes very important. Question three, do you feel in your prayer that this is indeed the person God intends for you, that God wants you to spend your lives together? And does this person feel the same? Now, I understand that sometimes it is hard to be 100% sure. We are after all human and we can't always know the will of God perfectly. But God does help us to know enough um, through the work of the Spirit. And that through the Spirit, we sense the peace of God about the relationship. Question four, do the two of you deal with conflict in a healthy way? Conflict is normal. Don't think that a couple in love doesn't have conflicts. But we grow in our relationship through conflicts. Are both of you willing to resolve issues together? Are you so committed to each other that you are willing to put each other first? Is God truly at the center of your life so that you are able to deal with conflicts in the love and the kindness of Christ? That through the Spirit, you treat each other with steadfast love and gentleness. You know, it is hard when we are under a lot of pressure and when life is stressful. I was one of the pastors in a big church with more than a thousand people in, sun, in the Sunday services. I was very busy in ministry. Catherine was working full time and she was the main breadwinner. After a few years, we had to leave that church because it was just too much for us. And it was then that I realized the strain and the pressure that we were under when I was a pastor. We both needed healing from God. And Catherine told me that, uh, told me how insignificant she felt in the church, that he, she was known to many people as Pastor Su Feng's wife, not Catherine. And for me, I needed God's healing from the mistreatment that I experienced. And I had to work out what exactly God wanted me to do now that a chapter of my life had finished. We were about 12 years into our marriage and it was a tough season for us. But it was our commitment to God and commitment to each other that got us through. We learned to communicate our feelings, say sorry to each other, overcome misunderstandings, recognize each other's pain, and support and nurture one another in the love of Christ. We continue to seek God's kingdom. We ask God how we might serve him and glorify his name as married couple made in God's image. 
Now we have been married for another 23 years, 35 years all together. I know that I wouldn't have made it without Catherine, and it is her commitment to God that has made all the difference. Now, I would like to make a few practical suggestions about dating. Not that I'm an expert at all. Only had one example, one good, good experience. <laughs> First, make sure that your relationship with the person you're dating is not primarily based on physical attraction. I think it is quite obvious that physical attraction alone is not enough, and I don't have to elaborate on that, do I? Second, make sure that the relationship is not one-sided. It can't be that one person keeps giving selflessly and the other person doesn't. It is not healthy if one person sacrifices more than the other. Love has to be mutual in that kind of relationship. Third, ask the question, can you trust this person, this person that you're dating with? Are there doubts about how trustworthy that person is? I think it is fair to say that as a couple's relationship matures, there's an ongoing and consi consistent trust between the two persons. Okay, but now you might be thinking, too much information, too many questions. Well, if I were to ask only one question, it would be, are you growing in Christ together? Are you able to support and encourage each other to be the person that God wants you to be as individuals and as a couple? In summary, a Jesus-centered relationship is one that you, as two persons in one flesh, are able to bear God's image and glorify God in everything you do. In other words, the relationship of this couple is a sacred space a God space in which they nurture and support one another so that they become the people that God wants them to be in Christ Jesus. Let me say this again. The Jesus-centered relationship between two lovers is a sacred space, a God space in which they nurture and support one another so that they become the people that God wants them to be in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a beautiful an intimate place where the couple rejoices together and shares sorrows together. Let me conclude with something that I mentioned at the start. Relationships are complex. Sometimes a couple enjoys their life together in Christ to the very end of life, but that's not always the case. Some people cannot find a life partner and remain single. Some married couples separate after spending years together. Some couples are going through a difficult time in their marriage. The thing is, every person is different, every couple is different, and every situation is different. People do make mistakes, and sometimes relationships, a relationship can go wrong even though people have done their very, very best. Our job as fellow Jesus followers is to support those who are going through a rough patch. Let us be gentle, loving, and kind, not judgmental, not jumping to conclusions, and let us learn the art of deep listening. Friends, no matter what your relationship, your relationship looks like now, God loves you. God knows that relationships are complex. And we love you. We are here to walk with you, walk with each other. You may have gathered that my father wasn't very kind to my mother. It wasn't a good marriage relationship at all. How I wish that life was better for mum. Tragically, mum died at the age of 55 by herself at home when everyone was overseas. She was a good wife and a good mother. She was always there for her husband and for her children. It's just not fair for her to die without anyone by her side. But I take comfort in the fact that mom became a Christian a few years before her passing. You see, I believe that God saw her and showed her mercy. God was there every time she was mistreated. God was there when she had to endure so much in her marriage. 
God was with her because she had a relationship with God. This brings me to an important reminder for all relationships. Our own relationship with God is most, most important. Ultimately, God's love and presence is all that we need. Let us develop an intimate relationship with Jesus. And this is only when we maintain a close relationship with God that we can truly be who we are in Christ, that we can truly relate to the other person in a healthy manner. It is only when we cultivate an intimate relationship with God that we can truly support others and to care for others. The first Bible passage we read today was from Genesis. I think it is only fitting to finish with Revelation. Let me read to you a passage from Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude. So try to hear. Then I heard that's what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Despite all the messiness of life and despite all our brokenness, we have something super wonderful, super awesome to look forward to, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us wait on God. Let us look forward to that day when we will all partake in the most beautiful marriage ceremony, that celebration, and that we will be with God forever. Amen.